If you had a dollar for every time somebody said in church when they held up a microphone to them, oh, I don't need that thing, we could fund world missions. A hundred times over. Oh, I don't need that thing. I'm the guy going, I do need that thing. So, If you would please turn in your Bible to Revelation chapter 3. Revelation chapter 3. In 65 other books of the Bible, God has revealed himself to be who he is and the fact that he is the one responsible for creating mankind to begin with. In 65 other books of the Bible, he showed us how we came to be separated from a really close fellowship. He didn't create us to be separated from him. He created us to be with fellowship in him. He wants and wanted from the get-go a close relationship. And in the Garden of Eden, we messed that over because we were tempted. And I say we because we go, well, if Adam and Eve hadn't have done that. But at the same time, it's like there's a human piece of this that comes down to all of us where we're going to listen to what God had to say. And they heard what God had to say, so don't eat of that tree. But somehow or other, they were deceived. And so from that moment where they were deceived, there was a break in the fellowship. And through 65 other books of the Bible, God tells us about his relentless pursuit to bring us back into fellowship with him and what he's gone through to make that happen. But this 66th book of the Bible, the book of Revelation, for somehow or other, it's gotten this reputation being kind of spooky. It's like, oh, I don't want to read Revelation. It's kind of spooky. I don't want to read it. But even in this 66th book of the Bible, Revelation, God is revealing himself saying, I'm chasing you down. I want relationship restored. You are important to me, and I do love you. I want that, risk, that fellowship restored. And I'm glad God has given us the book of Revelation. But somehow or other, in the sophisticated 21st century church in North America, we don't get into Revelation too much. Oh, it'll scare people. They won't come. If we talk, they won't come if we talk about that. But I believe that the Bible is as relevant now as the time it was given to us that time. And if God says it's important for us to know, there's something inside of us that want to know. And so with that, he's giving us a whole insight as to this last piece in the whole history of this relentless pursuit of us. What's going to happen? How's this all going to end up? Like a, like a good novel. If the Bible were, were included in the novel section of bookstores, or if there are still bookstores, I don't know. Um, maybe there's one or two left someplace. Otherwise, it's Amazon. But if the Bible were included in a, in a novel section, the back part of that, you know what it talks about all what it is? It would say the, 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 uh, the, the breakup of the, of the friendship between God and man and the relentless pursuit of God to chase man back down. That would be how that was all given out. And so in Revelation, the very first chapter, we find Jesus glorified self. And he reveals himself to us, because it is called the book of Revelation. So what is it that he's revelating to us? What is it he's revealing to us? And he's saying, this is my glorified self in chapter 1. In chapters 2 and 3, he has some specific things to say to his people, church people. He's talking to church people. So the book of Revelation has some things to say to his people and to all people ultimately because our purpose for the church is to communicate to everyone else what God has to say. And so with that, we, we want to take what he has to say and really find out what it means. What did he really have to say to us? And why did he say it? And why is it important that we know? So we come to Revelation chapter 3. In Revelation chapter 3, is one of, those, one of those pieces here that you go, wow, this is kind of interesting. What it, wonder what it really means. Let's read it real quick, and then we'll break it down. Revelation chapter 3, verse 14, to the church at Laodicea. There were seven churches that Jesus had specific things he wanted to say to them. He gave a specific, well, I mean, they're not long enough to be called a letter. They're called a letter at each church. He calls them a letter. We might call them a memo. Jesus says, take down a memo. I want to send this to the, the church at Laodicea. The Laodicean church of God. OK? 
okay? And we'll put it that way. And he says this, verse 14, he says, To the angel of the church in Laodicea write the Amen. He's speaking of himself. The Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God says this. In other words, he's saying, i got some things to say to you. I want you to know who I am that's actually speaking. I'm the Amen. I'm the faithful and true one. There's, if you're true, there's no falseness in you, right? Right? Because if you're true, true north is true north, Right? If he's true, he's true. Okay? Verse 15. He says, I am true and I'm the faithful witness and I want you to know that I know your deeds. That you're neither hot or cold. And I would that you were hot or cold. So because you are lukewarm and neither hot or cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. Because you say, I'm rich and I've become wealthy and I have need of nothing. And you do not know that you're wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. Now, if you're going to try to get people to come to church and you want to fill every pew, you're not going to say to them, you're poor and wretched and miserable and blind, and by the way, you're naked, right? That is not going to fill the house. (laughs) So you kind of got to figure out, okay, why did he say that? Verse verse, uh, 18. I advise you... To buy from me gold refined by fire, that you may become rich, and white garments that you may clothe yourself, and that, you, and that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed, and I salve to anoint your eyes that you may see. Verse 19. Write verse 19 down. Because in the 21st century North American church, we tell that Jesus loves us, and he does love us. Don't go out of here thinking he doesn't love us. He loves us. Look at verse 19. What does he say? To whom I love, I reprove and discipline. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. Just hang on that for a minute. Verse 20. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him, and I will dine with him, and he with me. He who overcomes, I will grant to him to sit down with me on my throne, as I have overcome and sat down with my Father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Okay, so what do we got here? We want to find out exactly what he's saying. Have you ever been to a movie set, Universal Studios? Anybody ever go to Universal Studios at one point or another? Did it take you down the street to see the, did they have like a movie set down through there? And and usually on that movie set, on the front of the movie set, it looks really good because that's the part that you see on the movie. When you look behind, was there anything? There's nothing behind. There's nothing on a movie set. There's nothing behind the scenes. So what we see on a movie or on TV is like this perfect little town, Mayberry. I love, love the Andrew Griffith show. And Mayberry, it's got, this is, looks, looks perfect. But if you see that, actually, if you see what was behind all, this, all the stuff in Mayberry, none of those buildings were real. It was like earth shattering. It's like, none of those are real. They're all empty shells. And so, sadly, well, well, let me put it this way. It appears to be one thing, right? The movie said appears to be one thing. But when you look behind it, It's not anything like it's portraying itself to be. And sadly, there are Christians like that. There are people who will identify with Jesus Christ. Say, well, I go to church. Jesus hangs out at church. I hang out at church. And they identify themselves that way. But Monday through Saturday doesn't look anything like Sunday morning. Right? And there are churches like that. We have wonderful buildings, and I am not picking on wonderful buildings. I love my electricity. I love my air conditioning. I love my heat in the wintertime, and I love to flip a switch and the light come on because I don't like a dark room. If you've, any of you hung around me long enough to go, why are all the lights off in here? I start flipping them on. <clears throat> right, Bobby? <laughs> Pretty much, that's the truth. I'm not living in a dark house. So I am not picking on nice things, but we've got a lot of nice churches that are empty shells. Let me just get to the point. Because they look great, and they're saying, we're a church. The sign out front says, we're a church, but inside, there's, there, the, the, the self-identification of a church ends when you walk inside, because inside there's nothing behind there. 
There's nothing behind there. And that's what this Laodicean church is. Why did that church make Jesus sick? Because when you see it says, you're neither hot nor cold, I'll spit you out of my mouth. In the Greek, and this is gross, but just hang with me. In the Greek, it means I'm going to vomit you out of my mouth. You make me sick. Well, why is that? Well, we're going to find out why that is. Because they were portraying themselves to be one thing, and they weren't. And Jesus said, you say that you're with me, and you're not really with me. You say that you're hot, and you're not hot. You're not even cold. If you were hot, I could do something with you. If you were cold, I could warm you back up. But you know what you are? You are indifferent. You are indifferent to me. You say you're one thing, and you're not. And it makes me sick. You make me sick because you say you're one thing, and you're not. So he says, I know your deeds. You're not, for, you're, hot, you're not hot for me. You're not cold for me. You're just indifferent. I want you to know I know your deeds. I want you to know I'm with you. I haven't forgotten. You know, in the 21st century, I haven't walked out and just like parked myself and left you on your own. In fact, Jesus is just as relevant now as he was on the day of Pentecost. Right? Because he says, I am unchanging. I am the first and last. I'm the Alpha and the Omega. It starts with me, it ends with me, and I don't wear out. And we've somehow or other, in the church in North America, we've somehow or other parked him on the bench going, I don't, we don't want to offend anybody with Jesus because we won't fill the seats. That's like, wait, wait, wait a minute here. He's saying, I know your deeds, and you're supposed to be doing something for me. If you're going to identify with me, what are you doing in your generation, in your time in history to build something for the kingdom? What are you doing? And so... He says, I see what you do. I know your deeds. I know your actions. I know your work. And he's saying from his perspective for the kingdom, you guys aren't doing anything for the kingdom. You've got some of the best buildings I've ever seen. But you're not doing anything for me with that. Now, we might be identifying some things. So in that, we've got to get, and I had a conversation with a young guy here recently. He goes, well, what's all that mean? And I said, you've got to get Jesus' perspective. His perspective is not our perspective. Right? We have a perspective that says, well, we're doing some stuff here. And what did this church find out? This church said about themselves, you say, you say, verse 17 says, I am rich and I've become wealthy and I've need of nothing. So from the perspective that they were doing church, from the perspective that they were going about it, they're going, what do we need? Everybody should come because we got all this stuff. We have air conditioning. I've told this story before and I love this story. When JP and Courtney got married, they went kind of, kind of a honeymoon, so to speak. Um, to, so he took, him, took Courtney home to his family to meet, meet the family. And I always tease Courtney and JP. I said, this is, this is like, I tease Courtney more than JP about it. I said, this was like the episode of I Love Lucy, where Lucy went home to Cuba, and she didn't know the language. <laughs> Courtney goes, yeah, it kind of was like that. So he went to church. And she said, Dad, you wouldn't believe it. There were people waiting in line to get in the church. Every seat in church was filled. And there were people waiting to get in line because they couldn't get in. And I was teaching Sunday school class at the time, so they'd come back and they were telling about this. And I said, oh, I said, is that because is that there was air conditioning? The only place you can get air conditioning in Nairobi is in church. And JP just laughed. He said, there's no air conditioning in Kenya. <laughs> And I said, why were all those people there? Why were all those people standing in line? Why were all those people there? And we've got not just us. I'm not picking on us. We've got a lot of empty seats in every church in Piatt County. And we have air conditioning. <laughs> and bathrooms. Did you know what you said? <laughs> Oh, padded seats. I thought she said bathrooms. Yes. Padded seats. So our perspective is this. Okay? It's a change of perspective. Our perspective is, what else do we need? People should be so attracted to the buildings we've built and the stuff that we have. Won't they just come because it's attractive? What else do we need? We don't need anything. I've become... Well, rich, rich, and I've become wealthy, and I don't need anything, verse 17. I don't need anything. What else do we need? People should just come because it's attractive. 
and the building's cool, and the parking lot's paved, and whatever else. And yet, it's kind of empty. You don't want to know that you want to know where, where the worship seats are all full every Sunday, and there's a standing line to get in. Brett, that would be Soldier Field. <laughs> Until December. <laughs> but at least the first month of the season, everybody shows up. And we worship there for three hours at the football field. And we're hoping the game goes in overtime. But on Sunday morning, we're going, well, I hope this gets over quick. <laughs> Surely the service won't go into overtime. We want extra innings, right? We want extra innings. And, but not in church. But Jesus' view of this is, let me tell you my view, because we're measuring us by us, right? That church is saying, I don't need anything. I should just, it should be attractive enough that people will come. And Jesus says, let me, let me give you a different perspective. Let me give you my perspective. And my perspective is this. He is revealing to us how he measures our work in relation to building his kingdom. He's measuring how we are building his kingdom. So he tells this church, I have this against you, not because he hates them, not because he dislikes new buildings, certainly not because he dislikes padded pews, because I think Jesus would like a padded pew. He'd really sit on anything, but I'm just saying, right? He's not hating on him because he's hating on him. He's saying your perspective is wrong. Because you're identifying with me. Your sign out front says you stand with me. And yet inside, you don't have anything going on for me. You're not building my kingdom. And that's why he was hard on this church. Out of the seven, out of the seven churches, this is the one church that really didn't have anything going on. They said, oh, we got it going on. Because we don't need anything. He's going, you got nothing going on. And from my perspective, from my perspective, Jesus is saying, let me tell you what it looks like when I look at you. When I look at you, you do not know. You're wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. And it's hard. I mean, we're going, okay. Well, what's going on? Well, his perspective is, what are we doing for his kingdom in our generation? During our time in history, during our time in history, what are we doing for him? Because all things measure to that. If we're going to identify with him, if we're saying we are the church, we want to build the church, we want to do the church. The church is more than just getting people to show up on Sunday morning so we can count them because it's kind of become a club. Right? It's kind of become what Reggie McNeil calls, I quote Reggie all the time, kind of becomes churchianity. Churchianity. And so, so we define success when we measure our own selves. We don't need anything. Here's how we're measuring ourselves. If pews are pit filled, we're collecting money, and the budgets are paid. Some denominations go, are your budgets paid? How many people are coming? You have to send in a report every year. Are your budgets paid? And he's saying, how do we define success? Because if we're really creating a Hollywood street scene for ourselves, one in which our church looks perfect, but there's really nothing going on on the backside, he doesn't have any use for that. He said, you're not, when you do that, you're just not hot, you're just not cold. And I don't have any use for you. Be one or the other. Get in or get out kind of thing. Right? And that's what he's saying. Now, he does say, remember, don't forget, verse 19, those whom I love. He is not saying, I don't love you. He's saying, I do love you. You who I love. I want you to know, I do love you. But I want you to get this right, because this is important for the kingdom that you get this right. This is important for eternity that you get this right. But they relied on themselves, and they gloried in their self-sufficiently, self-sufficiency, and they said, oh, we don't need anything. So their scorecard was their scorecard. You know, when you play basketball by yourself, you're the greatest player on the court. <laughs> it's the only game you can do that. And you can make up your own scorecard and go, man, that was awesome. I'm awesome. 
That's the only game. Sometimes we make up our own scorecard. And that's what these people had done. That's what that church had done. They made up their own scorecard. Reggie McNeil says this. This hurts. Okay? But I'm just giving you a heads up. If you want to leave, leave now. All right. Out of his book, The Present Future, he says this. The result of the modern church's form of spirituality is a North American church that is largely on a head trip. The basic assumption of the past to Christian maturity involves the acquisition of biblical information. But the church in North America has reduced its understanding of spirituality to numbers that can be reported. The church is doing well if the membership is up, the giving is solid, and the facility square footage is continually increasing. And that's how we score ourselves. But Jesus has another question for us. He said, what are you doing for me? What are you doing for my kingdom? You're identifying with me. I'm glad you're identifying with me. I want you to identify with me. What are you doing for my kingdom? How are you building out my kingdom? What are you doing? But I think, I think, I think, we're kind of more enamored with our own accomplishments and our own knowledge and our own achievements than we are with sharing the good news that Jesus Christ can transform lives. I think, collectively. Now, I don't want that to be us. Our fellowship, hopefully, is not that. Because really what we only have is the ability to change someone. The kingdom of God is to bring light into darkness. To bring positive change into a negative situation. That doesn't mean everything will always be perfect. Because it will not always be perfect. Are you with me? It does, I'm not saying that. Don't walk out here and say, oh, Steve said it's going to be good. No, it's not. No, it's not. But that doesn't mean God is not on the throne. That doesn't mean the stuff that we go through doesn't mean he's left or he's forgot or he didn't see or I didn't. Oh, gosh, I'm sorry, guys. I didn't see that, come, that one coming. He's still there. But if we re become self-reliant and we become self-funded, so to speak, and we completely leave Jesus out, there's nothing left to change our hearts. There's never been a building that saved a sinner. Might have been a few that saved inside the building, but the building itself never saved a sinner. A padded pew seat, chair, never saved a sinner. The hottest worship band, while it can communicate the goodness, just because they're hot, with a light show and fog, just because they're hot, <laughs> does not mean that salvation and transformation is going to take place. And there's nothing wrong with it. And trust me, as a musician, I, I, like, I, like, I like making it rock, you know? But that's not our calling card. What is our calling card? What is our calling card? 2 Timothy, if you want to turn your, in your Bible to 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy chapter 1. Second Timothy chapter one. We're going to read verses six, seven, and eight. <clears throat> and this is a as a letter that Paul personally wrote, or Paul wrote to as a personal letter to Timothy. Timothy was a young pastor who needed encouragement. Part of what we're supposed to do is encourage one another. And Paul was building into him. Don't give up. I know this is hard. Don't give up. Don't quit. Let me tell you, hang in there. And we all need to hear that. We all need to be building up each other. Don't quit. Hang in there. It's not, worth, it's not worth giving up. Don't trade it all away. Hang in there. Right? And he says, 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 6 says, And for this reason I remind you to kindle afresh the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of my hands. For God has not given us a spirit of timidity, but of power and love and discipline. Therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord. And he goes on. Do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord. Do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord. God's not given us a spirit of timidity. 
Oh, I better not say anything. I'll shake up the, shake up the environment. Shake it up. Because what we're doing now isn't working. You know, if, if we were to take, take how we want to measure stuff, we want to measure stuff on a return on investment. We've invested in our facility and our seating and all that. Well, how's that going? That alone should tell us facility alone isn't going to change a heart. Facility alone isn't going to make, make a transformation in someone's life. So if we're going to stand with him and we're going to put up a front shell, hopefully we build something on the back that says, this is a complete package. Because Jesus told this church, you are not a complete package. Jesus tells them how to fix their problem and he directs those people back to him. Dr. Tony Evans says, I advise you to buy from me. It sounds like a commercial on the news. You should buy gold. And then about a month later, you should buy silver. And then you should invest here and you should invest there. And Jesus was trying to talk their language. Those people think like we do, right? We've got money. We need to invest it. And he's trying to relate to them, and he is relating to them. And he's saying, here's what I want you to do. If you want to get this right, I invest you buy gold from me. Well, what's different about his gold than, than our gold? Well, he's coming at it from a spiritual perspective, right? God is a spirit, and those who worship him must worship him how? Spirit and in the truth. So he's trying to get us to relate, get our eyes off the physical and say, this is how I want you to think about this. Think about this from my perspective. My perspective comes from the, from the spiritual. I want you to think about how I'm thinking about this. Why? Because I love you, he says in verse 19. He says, I want you to buy spiritual gold. What's that mean? Well, wait, why do we even invest in gold to begin with? Well, we invest in gold. If we do, I've, I've not. <laughs> Just be clear. <laughs> I've got time to tell this story. When we went in business for ourselves, my backup plan was if something went south, I'm going to sell everything except the kids. <laughs> well, and Bobby, I mean, we, we don't... <laughs> Thanks, Tina. You're helping me out a lot. Now we're off time. <laughs> I'm selling everything except the kids and Bobby, right? And so when the Great Recession hit, which fortunately only lasted six months, when the Great Recession hit, and I said, oh, I'm going to start selling stuff. Do you know what? It wasn't worth a dime. Because <laughs> everybody else was selling their stuff too. It's like, oh, fine. So what's different about his gold than our gold? Well, his gold is a, has spiritual substance. If gold is to give our assets substance, some hard physical substance, and he's telling us, I want you to buy from me gold. What kind of gold does he have? Well, his gold is spiritual substance. His gold is something that has life beyond this physical world that we live in. Because why? Because he says in another place, on that last day, everything burns up. The gold, the silver, everything burns up. There won't be any of this stuff left. So I, buy, I advise from you to buy from me spiritual gold and spiritual clothes. What's he mean by that? He's meaning that we think we've got ourselves covered. If clothing is a covering, and these people thought that they had themselves covered... He's saying, you don't have yourself covered at all. In fact, spiritually, you're naked. Right? Spiritually, you don't, have, you don't have anything going here. So let me tell you, why don't you buy from me some spiritual clothes to cover yourself in a spiritual way. And the third thing is healing for your spiritual ailments. Because he says, uh, an eye salve to anoint your eyes that you may see. The Laodicean area was known for its medical uh, uh, medicinal uh, work. They, they created, they had some things there in their soil that they used for eye salve that, to help people see again. Uh, they were known as a medical center. Really, that church was kind of like a New York City. 
They were, that Laodicea was like that. It had commerce, it had medical, it had all this stuff going on. And so when he starts talking their language, here's what I think you ought to do. You ought to buy some gold from me. And you ought to cover yourself with, you know, go to my garment district and cover yourself up with, with my garments. You know, New York's got a garment district. You ought to come to my garment district because I'll get you covered spiritually. And he's saying, healing for your spiritual sickness, I salve. Get it from me because I'll help you see clearly. I'll help you see what's going on. So he's, he's talking their language. But that gets us down to verse 20. And there's some other things we could talk about. I mean, I'm telling you, all these churches, I, I could preach two sermons off of each one of these. I really could. There's so much in here. But I want to get down to this, to this last part here, verse 20. Jesus says this to his people. These are people who identify themselves as church. We are the church because we go to church, and that's my church. I go to that church. I go to the Laodicean Church of God. It's my church. And he says this in verse 20, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I'll come into him, and I'll dine with him and he with me. This is his church understand where he's placed himself outside. He said, I'm standing at the door knocking to what? Get in. I'll come in if you'll open the door. But I'm not coming in unless you want me in. I'm not coming in unless you want me in. If you don't want me in, I'm going to stand right here. Because I'm not going to force myself on you. If you, don't, if you don't want me to be a part, do it your way. Scariest phrase in the Bible, I think, is God gave them over to. God gave them over to what they wanted. Because they didn't include him. And he's saying to his church, do you want me to come in? That picture is awesome. That picture back there on that wall it's always been portrayed, and I grew up in the church, and I always remember that, church, that picture, and, and it works for this, but it was like Jesus knocking on the, on the door of a heart. Will you let him come in, right? And to accept him as Savior and Lord. And that's true. And that picture works for that. But here, the people are saying, no, nah, I'm with Jesus. And he's going to let me in? Because I'm not feeling a whole lot of part of your group right now. I don't feel part of the club. Dr. Tony Evans said this, just because you're having church doesn't mean Jesus is in the sanctuary. So the question is, and it'd be easy, it'd be like shooting fish in a barrel, stand up here and point fingers at other people, but I'm not going to do that. The question is, have we let him in? We're lodge fellowship, and we're responsible for what we do. And I'm going to break it down even farther than that. Individually, have we let him in? Are we making him a part? Are we making him a part? And again, I don't say this out of any other reason. I'm not saying this to be dramatic. I'm not saying that. I'm just looking at verse 19. It says, those whom I love, I reprove and discipline. I want you to be zealous. I want you to be powerful. I want you to stand up for me and make a difference in your time. The breath I give you now, your generation, what are you doing to build me out? How are you making a difference now? What are you doing for me? And I'll be a part of that if you let me in. Because if I get to come in, guess what we do? We hang out together. What is his whole purpose from Genesis? To reestablish relationship. What does he say down here? He says, if you let me come in, anyone hears my voice, I'm knocking and I'm asking, hey, anybody, you guys in there? Hey, anybody in there? They can't hear him knocking because the guitar is too loud. Anybody, anybody in there? Are you going to... Doug got it. And that was usually me. Anybody going to let me in? Because if you let me in, I'll come in and I'll dine with you. We'll sit down and have a meal together. Your most trusted friends you sit down and have dinner with. Want to go get coffee? Let's get together and have dinner. 
right? We do that with our most trusted friends. And Jesus is going, am I one of those people? Am I one of those people? Guys, I want you to come back. I want to do, I just, I just, I don't, only because I just want to hear this song again. I just want to hear it again. Just a verse and a chorus to let the worshipers arise. Because I like that song. You don't have to sing it. I just want to hear it. Because that song so describes, I love the visualization. Drawing a line in the sand. You in or you out. I just want to know. I'm not hating on you. He's not saying anywhere in there, I hate you. He says, I love you, but I want to know. You let me in or not? Are you going to let me in or not? And he says this, because this church is guilty of indifference. And I'm telling you, if you look at the churches, if you look at Christianity in North America, and we kind of go, yeah, 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 I go. And that's what Jesus hates, is indifference. How can we, how can we come in contact, have at the door, who, the one who in Revelation chapter 1 describes himself as this, clothed in a robe, reaching to his feet, girded across his breast with a golden girl, girdle, his head and his hair were white like wool, like snow, and his eyes were a flame of fire, and his feet were burnished bronze when it had been caused to glow in a furnace, and his voice was like the sound of many waters, and in his right hand he held seven stars, and out of his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword, and his face was like the sun shining in its strength. And how can we go, I don't know, I'll, I'll go once a month. I'll go once a month. I mean, I, I'm just not sure what church got for me. If that's the case, I don't think we've really come in contact with the real life Jesus Christ. I just don't. It's got to have a change, right? It's got to make a difference. If he's all that he says he is, and he is all that he says he is, you can't yawn at that. We can't yawn at that. So I leave it with this. The one who overcomes, you can sit down with me on my throne, and that's a reference to what's about to come at the end of the church. We can experience the kingdom here now, but we will forever be with him in his kingdom, on his throne, if we overcome indifference. And we say, I, I, I want to let him in. I want to let him in. So the question is for us as a fellowship, I, you come if you want to come. We've got the rocks. We want to know the rocks are for is for something I want to overcome. Write it down on a piece of paper and say, Lord, I want to overcome this. And if indifference is our thing, write it down and say, I'm not walking out of here indifferent anymore. I'm not going to do it. I won't walk out indifferent. I won't walk out unchanged. I won't walk out leaving him outside my door. I'm either in or out. And here's the deal. I'm, again, I'm not doing this for any other reason than to say, he left it here for us. He said, I want you to know this about me. I want you to understand this. Here's how relationship is restored. 65 other books of this Bible. And it's God chasing us down. Here he's saying, let me tell you, it's this simple. You open the door. Just open the door and let me in. Just open the door and let me in. If that's what you need to do today, do it. If you just need to turn to somebody sitting next to you and go, you know what? I'm not walking out of here unchanged. And do that. I want you guys to sing that song.